Well, let us pray. Oh, gracious God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Lord, thank you for the life that we have in the spirit, in Christ, and for the work that you're doing in us personally and us together. And now as we engage the scriptures this morning, Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds, that you would speak to us personally and to us together as a community. And Lord, that we might not only be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of the word for your glory and for the sake of this world. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Well, my name is Brian Keepers, and I'm the lead pastor here at Trinity, and I am really excited about the scripture that we're about to engage this morning, um, because I have never preached on this passage, and I'm guessing that this may be a passage of scripture that may not be very familiar to a lot of us. Um, but it's, it's just, the, these, are, these are the Sundays when um, I get to spend time preparing for a sermon like this, and I think, I get paid for this? Uh, and I feel that way this morning. I'm really excited to invite you into this story today. So hear the word of the Lord from the book of 2 Samuel. I'm actually, we're going to focus on 2 Samuel 9, verses 1 through 13, but I want to jump to chapter 8, verse 15, because I think it's a great lead-in to the, the heart of the story we're going to hear. Hear the word of the Lord. So David reigned over all of Israel, and David administered justice and equity to all of his people. Chapter 9. David asked, Is there anyone left in the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and he was summoned to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. The king said, Is there anyone remaining of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? Ziba said to the king, There remains a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and did obeisance, or fell down flat in front of him. David said, Mephibosheth. He answered, I am your servant. David said to him, Do not be afraid, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all of the land of your grandfather Saul, and you yourself shall eat at my table always. He did obeisance again and said, What is your servant that you should look upon a dead dog such as I? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to his house I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food to eat. But your master's grandson, Mephibosheth, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands of his servant, so your servant will do. Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he always ate at the king's table. Now he was lame in both feet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So just a quick survey. How many of you have ever heard that story in the, the larger day? Oh, some of you have. Okay, well, um, but what, you know, it's one of those stories that doesn't make the greatest hits for David. And first and second Samuel, first and second Kings. Um, so we're going to get into that in a moment. But, but first, a story. It, it was a wonderful surprise. 
When I pulled up to the drive-thru of the Starbucks in Sioux Falls, the barista reached through the window and handed me a steaming cup of coffee with a smile on her face and said, the person in front of you paid your bill. They told me to tell you to pay it forward. I had been feeling a bit irritated that day, and with this act of kindness from this stranger, suddenly my irritation melted, and it was like there was a sudden burst of gratitude. Have you ever had something like that happen to you? Raise your hand if you have, if somebody's done a random act of kindness for you. A stranger treats you with a surprise, something unexpected, does something generous for you, and it just feels so good, doesn't it? I mean, doesn't it just make your day? What feels even better, though, perhaps, is when we get to be on the giving end, uh, when you get to do a random act of kindness for somebody else. You know, in a world where there is so much selfishness and cruelty, uh, I think that we could all use a few more random acts of kindness, don't you, right now? So we're in the middle of a sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, the different virtues of life in the Spirit, life in Christ that Paul mentions in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 26. And, and here's what we've covered so far. We've explored the spiritual fruit of peace, love, joy, and patience. But today we're going to look at the fruit of kindness. Now, this story that we heard earlier from 2 Samuel uh, may seem like a, a strange story to consider in a sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit. But as you will see, as we talk about this and unpack it a little bit more, this is a beautiful story that demonstrates the spiritual fruit of kindness. In fact, when we think about the word of kindness, um, I'm guessing that a lot of us probably think of something like I began the sermon with this morning. A random act of kindness, um, buying someone's coffee, maybe paying for somebody's bill at the restaurant. Uh, or, or we think of maybe something like this, like being nice, right? A kind person is a nice person, and a nice person is polite. Uh, you're not a jerk. You say and do nice things to people. In Northwest Iowa, we have something called Northwest Iowa nice, right? Midwest nice, which unfortunately sometimes can feel a little bit superficial or maybe even fake for some people. Is this what the Bible has in mind when it talks about kindness? Are we talking about things like random acts of kindness or being a nice person? Those are wonderful things, but actually the Bible has something in mind that is far deeper and more substantial. The primary word that the Bible uses, particularly in the Old Testament, to talk about kindness is one of the most important words in the entire Bible, uh, and it's, it's the word hesed. Now, some of you are going to recognize that word. If, if you were with us in January when we did a sermon series on the Old Testament bo uh, book of Ruth and Naomi, uh, then you'll, you'll recognize that word because that story was all about hesed. In fact, if I hadn't already preached on that, I probably would have chosen it for today, for Mother's Day. Um, but hesed, here's, here's, here's the best way to translate hesed. Loving kindness or steadfast love. You can also translate it, sometimes it's translated as mercy, goodness, and justice. We heard it this morning at the beginning of the service with Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His hesed, His loving kindness, His steadfast love, endures forever. Now here's the thing about hesed. Hesed is not a sentimental feeling. Uh, again, it's more than just being nice or, or doing kind of random acts of kindness. Hesed, at its heart, is about covenant love. Covenant love. This was perfect for a day when we celebrate baptisms because we got to see Hesed in action. Hesed is about deep loyalty and commitment. It's a kind of love that goes above and beyond for the good of another person. Interestingly, in the Old Testament, when the prophets speak about hesed, like Micah and Zechariah, they often connect it to an act of justice, that, that justice, doing justice, is connected to loving kindness. It's about acting on behalf of those who are on the margins, the poor, the, the, the widow, the orphan, uh, those who are in places where they lack power. So here's, here's maybe kind of the working definition that I want to give you today as we think about this. Let's think of kindness, hesed, as this very intentional, not random act, but very intentional act of love that does good for another in the context 
of relationship. In the context of relationship, Whenever the Bible gives us a word like hesed, uh, what we see is that it's not so much interested in giving us a precise definition, but what the Bible likes to do is tell us a story. And so let's look at this story this morning to keep this from just being kind of abstract. Let's, let's look at this story of David and uh, Mephibosheth. So let me give you a little bit of context for the story. It's part of a larger saga between King Saul and King David. Here's some background. When, when King Saul uh, was king, the first king of Israel, King Saul was somebody who was more concerned about popularity and his appearance than he was about being faithful to God. So the Lord said that he was going to lose the throne, and even while he still remained on the throne, God chose another. God chose David, who was a shepherd boy, anointed him as the next king of Israel, who would be Israel's greatest king. But there was a time period that would happen before David grew up to assume the throne, about 20 years. In the meantime, David served in Saul's court, but Saul was jealous of him. Many of you know that story, and on many occasions, Saul tried to kill David. Now here's where, you know, this just is full of all kinds of drama, like perhaps a daily soap opera, that David's best friend was Jonathan, who was Saul's son. <laughs> so think about those dynamics. Jonathan, David's best friend, the son of David's enemy. On one occasion, when Saul was planning to kill David, Jonathan came and told David about this, and in effect, saved David's life. Because of this, this, this act of kindness, David and Jonathan made a covenant. The word hesed is used there. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 20. They made a covenant between one another, promising that they would care for each other's descendants should anything ever happen to one of them. So this takes place many years later then. Both Saul and Jonathan are killed in the field of battle. And David, by the time we get to 2 Samuel chapters 8 and 9, David has now ascended to the throne, and he is at the pinnacle of his success in power. And it's interesting that when he's in this, at this place of, of, of the pinnacle of his success in power, that he remembers his promise to Jonathan. And, and, and the storyteller wants us to give us a window into the heart of the kind of king that David is. This is a king who cares about justice and equity. This is a king who at this moment had nothing to gain by being faithful to this promise, but it speaks to David's integrity. So this is where the story picks up. David remembers this promise he made to Jonathan, so he goes and he says, Is there anyone left in the house of Saul to whom I may show hesed, loving kindness, for Jonathan's sake? Now, Ziba, a servant of the house of Saul, is summoned and brought to David, and David asks the question again, only with a slight variation. And notice this. This is important. David asks again, Is there anyone remaining in the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? It's an important variation. The hesed of God. David doesn't just want to show kindness. He wants to show a particular kind of kindness. This is the, 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 the act of covenant love. Remember, that's, that's again the idea. The act of covenant love, of faithfulness that God has shown God's people. That, that David's hesed, that he wants to show to the house of Saul, is rooted in God's covenant love for his people. I mean, how can David show this kind of covenant love that goes above and beyond? we would ask the same question of ourselves only because God has first shown us this love. One of my favorite lines in the liturgy, Ben, is when we say to a child, you love because God has first loved you. Once again, the fruit of kindness is founded in the character of God like all the fruit of the Spirit. We look to the nature of God. God is hesed. God is loving kindness. So Ziba the servant says to David, well, actually, there, 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 there is one son of Jonathan's. Uh, everybody's kind of forgotten about him. A lot of people don't even know that he exists. But there is one son, but, but he's, he's, he's damaged. He is crippled in his feet. David would learn that his name is Mephibosheth, which is just a great name. Although, hang on, and I'll tell you more about that. 
And he orders Ziba to go and get him and bring him to David. Now, Mephibosheth was first introduced as an aside. See, this is where, this is so much fun. I can't wait to share this with you. He was first introduced as an aside several chapters earlier in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. Like one verse. We're told that he was crippled as a child, and there's tragedy in this, when his nurse dropped him in a panicked uh, escape from the Philistines after Saul and Jonathan were defeated in battle. So Saul's household servants were forced to run for their lives, and this nurse picked him up and was carrying him. She, she dropped him. He was five years old at the time. Uh, they sought refuge in a small village then across the Jordan called Lodabar. And when Mephibosheth was dropped, he would never walk again. In that moment, his feet were ruined. So here's this, here's this guy who grew up in obscurity. He was lame. He was on the margins, forgotten about, unimportant. His name originally was probably something different. His birth name, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 9, was Meribel. But Mephibosheth may have been the nickname that others gave him after he was dropped. Because it literally means in Hebrew, seething dishonor. There's some pain in this story. Some Bible uh, commentators think that, that Mephibosheth, that name was a, was a name, it was a name calling. It was an insult. It was a way of calling attention to his disability and his victimized life. It's not a positive name. And if that is true, think about this. All the more remarkable that when this lame son of Jonathan is brought before David, what is the first word that David speaks out of his mouth? His name. Mephibosheth. A name that was perhaps used to ridicule, David turns and says it in such a way that shows him honor and dignity. David doesn't see a lame man. He doesn't seem some unnamed exile, some lowly person who's unimportant. When he looks at Mephibosheth, he sees a human being. He sees a person who is worthy of hesed. Mephibosheth's name is used seven times. In fact, when I was reading that story, it's a mouthful. It's used seven times in the story without a hint of disgust or denigration. Now listen, that's not by chance. The storyteller is doing this intentionally. Seven is an important word in the Bible. It means holiness, completeness. Do you see what's happening? When this... This man is brought before David. This man, seething dishonor was his name. There is redemption happening because of David's loving kindness, because David calls out to him and speaks to him with such honor and dignity. It reminds me of something that Henry Nouwen once said when he said that the most important thing that we can do for another person is to call out their belovedness see beyond the stereotypes, to see them as a real person. And David is, in effect, calling out Mephibosheth's belovedness. For the third time in the story, then, the word hesed comes up. David says, Mephibosheth, he answered, I am your servant. David said to him, do not be afraid, for I will show you hesed. There it is again. For the sake of your father, Jonathan. But this hesed goes beyond just words spoken. It's beautiful what David is doing here by the way that he's speaking this man's name. But it's also about action. And the next part is where we really see hesed in action. David goes on to say, I will restore to you the land of your grandfather Saul. David did not have to do this. But he cares about justice and equity. And he does what's right. He says, this land actually belongs to your family. I will restore it to you so that you can live on it and flourish. And then, listen to this next part, and you yourself shall eat at my table always. I mean, it's amazing that he would, again, this guy who is just on the margins, who is so unimportant, who, he, you could have just forgotten about him. 
But David not only gives him back the land of his grandfather, but David, the next part is even more striking, and the next part gets really at the heart of what Hesed, loving kindness, is all about, is that David then invites him into his life, to his table, to the king's table, into the inner circle of David's family. In other words, David makes him as his own son. Mephibosheth is so taken back by this act of kindness that he falls down on his face and he says, you know, who am I? Who am I that you should look upon a dead dog like me, that you would treat me with such kindness? The notion of Mephibosheth, you got to try saying that, Mephibosheth being welcomed into this new relationship with David to his table is so important to this story that the narrator mentions it two more times. Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons, verse 11, and then the story ends with this, the last line of the story. Listen to this. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem for he always ate at the king's table. Now, he was lame in both feet. Friends, is this not what God has done for us? God's hesed, God's covenant love, embodied most fully and decisively in the person of Jesus Christ, the one who finds you and me in our brokenness and our shame, our hearts crippled by sin who names us with dignity as his beloved, the one who lays down his life so that we might not only receive a new name and be given an inheritance we do not deserve, but so that we might be welcomed to his table, that we might be brought into table fellowship with Jesus. You need to know that's that's the thing that most upset the Pharisees with Jesus. It wasn't just that he healed those on the margins. He invited them to his table, which meant that he suddenly invited them into the context of relationship. And that's what God has done for us in Christ. We become part of God's family, named as sons and daughters of God. Amazing. And as those who have received this act of hesed in Christ, how are we now called to show this kindness to others? Because that's the question for us in every sermon as we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. If God has done this for us, what does it mean for us to practice hesed with others. I think one of the things that I want to emphasize about that this morning, again, I want you to think about what it means to act in love for the good of another, to call out another's belovedness, but to do it in the context of relationship. And if that is true, one of the nuances that I want to give to this is is that Hesed is really about a kind of relationship where there is both giving and receiving. Giving and receiving. That in a culture of self-sufficiency where we look to ourselves, we want to just take care of ourselves, Hesed calls us to interdependence, that we need each other. (laughs) That true kindness is about helping one another and receiving help from one another. Which for many of us, it's the receiving part that's the hardest, isn't it? It's the receiving part that's the hardest. And yet, this is what God calls us to do if we're to embody Hesed in in, in community with each other. Well, let me close today with a story about someone in my life, a friendship that is a gift to me, someone who calls out my belovedness and who embodies the Hesed of Jesus for me. Many of you know him. There he is. I think he's out here somewhere today. Where are you, Trav? There he is. You're not wearing your jersey today, though. You're you're being kind to me. Yeah. This is Travis Klein. Many of you know Travis. Travis is a member of our church family and an important person in our community. And when I think about Hesed, I think about Travis. I mean, on the one hand, this is the most unlikely of friendships. Travis, son of Walter Klein of the house of Vince Lombardi and Aaron Rodgers. The house of my enemy. (laughs) And me, Brian, son of Robert Keepers of the house of Bud Grant and Kirk Cousins. (laughs) This isn't supposed to work, folks. 
But this relationship does work, and here's why. Because of God's covenant love poured out to Travis and me and shared between the two of us. Travis shows me the spiritual fruit of kindness in so many ways, and he gave me permission to share this today. Um, he shows me that in so many ways. The way that he comes up and teases me with playfulness, the way he hugs me and tells me I'm his favorite pastor next to, and then he names off all the other pastors who are in front of me. <laughs> John O is number one, but I think only because he's a Packers fan. That's it. Every Christmas, Travis comes to our house and he brings my family a, a delicious cinnamon streusel with a Christmas card. And sometimes he'll drop off a bag full of candy for my girls. And whenever he makes popcorn for youth group, which he started doing again this last Wednesday night, he drops off a container in my office and I find it there the next day on Thursday waiting for me. But my favorite times with Travis are when we get to eat together when it's our turn to have him over for Sunday dinner. And you gotta get on his schedule, by the way. This guy has a heck of a social life. He loves spaghetti and meatballs, so we try to do that as often as we can, but sometimes we do Subway. When I'm in the presence of Travis, I feel like I'm in the presence of Jesus. And he has a way of simply by who he is of calling out my belovedness. And I hope that he feels the same way about Tammy and me too, that we call out his belovedness as well. Friends, there's just something about eating together, isn't there? That Hesed happens best at the table, over a meal. That's where relationship happens. That's where giving and receiving happens. That's when we realize how much we need one another. And that as we belong to Christ, we belong to each other. I love you, my friend. If you're looking for a practical step coming out of the sermon today, then here's one. Rather than doing a random act of kindness, although you could do that. I mean, that would, you know, if anybody wants to buy my coffee, I'll be, uh, you know, down at one of the coffee shops on Tuesday. But even better, can I give you this? If you want to get into action around this sermon today, here's one way. Do an intentional act of kindness. Not a random one, but an intentional one that builds a relationship. And what better way to do that than to invite someone to your table this week? And maybe someone you wouldn't naturally think to invite. Like maybe even a Green Bay Packers fan. And if you do that, then be ready for God to surprise you. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to give space this morning for us to be present to what's stirring in us. As I talked about my friendship with my brother Travis, I wonder who, who we're thinking about today. I wonder who's coming to mind. Is there somebody, a, a name or a face that you're giving us, that you're calling us this week to intentionally reach out to and and to show Hesed to. Maybe to invite over for a meal. And again, maybe it's a person that we wouldn't naturally think to invite, and yet, Lord, we know that often your best work happens in those unexpected ways and in unexpected relationships. Oh, Lord, we can only do this because you are a God who is so faithful in your love for us. Thank you, Jesus. And may that Hesed love always flow through into the lives of the people around us. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.